My name is John Ross with the Art of Retouching Studio and this is Behind the Retouching. This particular image was commissioned to me by Advanced Photoshop Magazine for issue number 128. And what you see here is a far cry from where the original image actually started. But let me take you a little bit farther back than that. I had previously done issue number 126 of Advanced Photoshop Magazine and in that particular situation we had a lot of back and forth between the editor and myself trying to figure out what the best image was, what the best uh, style of retouching was, and what they ultimately wanted. Now in this case it was a lot easier. I simply said pick the image that you want me to use and I'll give you a nice image based off of that. The editor was kind enough to send me back three different images that I could choose from and ultimately I chose this one because I thought it would give me the most dynamic image for a two page spread based off of my choices. However, the original image actually looked like this. And as you can see, it's quite a bit different than where I ended up. Now I wasn't quite sure where I was going to end with this image, but I knew that this one gave me the most options on the front end. I knew that I had the flexibility of scaling the building in the background. I could add some lens flares, add a little bit more drama with lighting as well as color that would ultimately allow me to pull elements forward and backward. And I also like this particular image because knowing it's a two page spread, I needed an image that gave the designers a lot of dead space to play around with so they could put in whatever elements they needed to in the final printed version. But on the front end, I knew a variety of things were going to have to happen. One of which was this building was going to have to be moved over a bit because the gutter, which is the split between the left and right pages, was going to be approximately here. So it's going to be right sitting inside of that separation of the pages. So I knew it needed to be moved over and more than likely blown up so that it was larger. I also knew that I had to take out the car as well as extend the side of the building as well as the sky. So I definitely knew there were some challenges in getting to the final image. To get started I knew the final size of the magazine so I needed to enter that into image canvas size. I'm from the United States and we work in inches. And because the magazine is located in England, their specifications came in as millimeters. So I'm going to change this to millimeters and I put in the information that they required and I can take this area here and I can tell it where to anchor the image. In this case, I moved it over here so that it added extra dead space onto this side, as you can see here. So I did that and now I know that this image is properly centered for the magazine. And I also know that that gutter falls in somewhere around here. Give or take, I'm just guessing. But as you can imagine, I certainly don't want that building right where the pages overlap and come in the middle. So I know that that building itself needs to be scaled larger and moved over to the right side. Preferably as centered on the page as I can but since the center of that page now falls along here somewhere, I know I can't have it that far over, so it's just going to fall along here somewhere in the middle. Now this particular image came from stock photography, which ultimately means that I don't know its origin, I don't know if anybody's touched it, retouched it, what's happened to it. I don't even have access to the raw file. All I have is the TIFF, that they allowed us to download as a high resolution file. And this was actually a problem and I saw this early on is that right here this looks awfully blown out and that ends up being a minor problem later on where I need to do something with this to put texture back in so it doesn't look like this completely white area with no detail whatsoever. While the natural desire is to jump into doing color corrections, tonal changes, lens flares, and otherwise making this image look really, really awesome. The reality of it is I need to start off with a clean image before I do any of that stuff. What that ultimately means is I need to take out this car, I need to extend the building, as well as the sky. 
Now, if you look right here, this part of the building is actually just enough information in order to take it and clone it and step it over. And I can also take it down one and step it over and bring it down one and step it over. And basically, I can recreate the entire site of this building based off of this one little piece of information. And I did that right here. If you look, you can see there is a discoloration in the background. And I just simply omitted that. My real goal here is to just give me a pattern. I can create lighting effects afterwards. I can alter the tones and not make it look so plain. But the real goal here is to just give me enough texture to make it look like this is how it could have been. Now something I noticed is when I extended this building, I actually had an odd problem right here where the side of this building just extended straight across. You see that? That's the original image, but it just doesn't work for me when you see it in this context. What I needed to do at this point in order to separate the different buildings, the foreground building from the background building, was actually offset it. And I did that on this layer here. See that? How I drop it down. And I no longer need this layer, which I saved specifically only for this video. As you can see, I extended it, but I dropped it. And now you can see the separation between one building to the other, to some degree anyway. And in doing so, you can also see that I've cropped into the car and basically cloned over it and hit it. I'm going to zoom in for you here to show you what I did. See, there was the car and I just simply cloned over it. My students often ask me how they should go about cloning something complex and in those cases I'll say take it in small steps, come from the left, from the right, from the top, from the bottom and work your way in piece by piece until you finally finish whatever detailed texture or pattern you're trying to mimic. So in this case we come in from this side into the car we come from the top into the car, we come from the bottom into the car, and then as we've finished off this area, we just do our best to mimic whatever would be replaced here. And my end result looked something like this. Now also notice that I had a little bit of the doorway in the background, and I was able to mimic that just enough to give it something that kind of belonged and I finished up this cloning with this layer right here. As you can see, I really just took the top, flipped it around, and gave myself a bottom. I extended the bricks a little bit and basically just filled it in. Again, pieces until you manipulate it just the way that you want it. As you can see, we have a corner of this building, we have a bottom of this building, we have ground that extends up to the building, now we need to finish extending the ground, the doors, and the sky. And that happens on this top layer. And as you can see, the before, after, before, after, once again, before and after. Now probably the more interesting technique in order to achieve this extension, I don't actually have the parts to show you because this literally is the whole thing. but. If you grab all of these layers here, actually this one can just be thrown away because that's irrelevant at this point. But if you take these, you can either go on a Mac Command E or on a PC, it's actually Control Alt E and it will give you a new merged layer. And the benefit of doing this, now I normally don't do this, but sometimes you do what you got to do. I can take the lasso and give myself some general shape here like this and then use one of the newer tools in Photoshop I say newer it's been around for a while but most people don't even know it's here is edit content aware scale now generally I'm not a big fan of content aware but uh, somewhere in version 6 and definitely in CC it started getting a whole lot better and Content Aware Scale was introduced in CS6 and here's what it can do. Watch this. I'm going to click and drag and you see what it just did? It scaled this. It just pulled it right over. 
but quickly that's pretty amazing you see how it just stretches the existing information now this is different than free transform because the free transform will literally just stretch all the pixels content aware scale will try and retain the core detail without touching it but stretch other parts that are fairly irrelevant to the image to give you a very loose uh, example if I take this building and do a free transform just to show you the difference if I do it this way look at what happens to that building okay that's definitely not what I had in mind and I do this with edit content to where scale watch what it's going to do notice how it's stretching the background but the building itself is being largely left intact just look at how much I'm stretching this image and that building is not being stretched at all it is simply moving over and it's filling the space but it's not actually being warped so in order to stretch this background as well as the ground here as well I also took the lasso and I just kinda did something like this and then I did edit content to where scale and I pulled it over and basically it just stretched it without distorting it it's very strange technology and nearly every time I've used it it's done wonders to get me from point A to point B without causing me a ton of extra work in order to get it there so I strongly recommend you at least play with it so as I was saying this is ultimately the final image where the car has been removed the ground the building and the sky have been stretched and this just gets me to a good base image and this is really where I started my actual retouching work I had to come up with what would have otherwise been a good raw file to start with but I didn't have a raw file as I said I started with a tiff in the background and then I had two layers of cloning which technically are irrelevant at this point point. and then I have this top layer which has the stretched and cloned backgrounds all combined together I could start working from this point forward but based off of the way that I prefer to work it's going to actually be grabbing all of these layers together right clicking and then go convert to smart object and when you do that it's going to give you a file that looks like this which is otherwise a single layer with all those sub layers still embedded inside of it if you don't understand smart object I have many videos that actually cover this topic so let's just assume you understand that a smart object is simply a collection or a folder uh, of other layers and other effects it simply squishes them all together so that I can build on top of it the benefit a smart object as opposed to just a group folder is that a group folder I can't put other filters on top of it but a smart object I can put filters on top of this single layer and that's exactly what I did as I mentioned I want this to mimic a raw file which it currently doesn't simply because it was supplied as a TIFF and then I put layers on top of it but now by crunching it all together it's not a raw file but I can actually go up under filter camera raw filter and when I click and I go inside of here this will give me the option to do raw color corrections tonal changes and other things that I want to do inside of the raw file even though it's not a, actually a raw file and now inside of this little down arrow I'm going to open it up and slide down and you can see I have a smart filter and the camera raw filter because it's a smart object that allows me to work with smart filters which means I can go back and edit this information at any point in time and right now the eye is turned off so it's hidden but once I turn it on you can see the effect that I got by using camera raw filter which is actually an incredibly huge difference this is the before and this is the after before and after before after so let's take a quick look inside a camera raw just to show you what changes I made to the actual file.
because it's a smart filter all I have to do is double click on the name of it and it's going to open up the file back in reloading all the settings so that I can tweak them or change them if I want to when it opens it up you could see that I added some magenta into the image I adjusted the exposure down a little bit and globally that's really all that I did generally I do a lot more with the global settings but in this particular case I did a lot more with the graduated filters and local adjustments to start the graduated filters looked like this when I click on this one you can see the mask and this change mainly adds a whole lot of warmth to this side of the image as well as improving the highlights and darkening the shadows and it just kind of gives it a bit of contrast this one over here comes from that side of the image and this is dropping it cooler and dropping the exposure and once again adding contrast in the highlights and the shadows so this is coming along this way and then lastly we have this one here which just comes from the bottom corner and this one adds a lot more warmth and the exposure adds and the highlight adds so basically all of these changes that I made inside of Camera Raw really start adding all the tonal and color values that are going to be in the final file. However, notice that I have it named Sky. And the reason it's named Sky is because, quite honestly, all of those changes I just showed you were for the sky itself. Because we have a layer above that called Building that has this mask on it, which will overlay all of these effects that you see down below with different effects so let me start by turning that on notice that that is exactly what it does because it was a copy of an earlier version before I did those camera raw changes then I can turn on the smart filters and then you can see what a difference I made so now I actually built off of this layer I made another copy of it and then I altered the camera raw settings now when you look at it this way you can see that it looks kind of funny but remember it's only the buildings and the ground that are actually being pulled from so the graduated filter I've got one coming from this angle coming in warming it up same thing I've got another one coming from over here and then another one coming from here basically all it is is I took from the first one you saw and then I altered it a bit to make it a little bit more dynamic for the buildings themselves and once they become overlapped this is how the image begins coming together I'm gonna to skip over this railing section right now for a moment I'll come back to that one now before I leave this part of the building with this raw filter I want to bring your attention down here to these windows and notice how they change when I turn this on and off so that's because I actually did a little bit more work if I double click on it it's going to bring me this now mostly it's the same as the previous file that we were working with but this smart object has a lot of work that went into these bottom windows I'm gonna hide these smart filters and show you that this is basically what I was cloning the first time around and it really doesn't make much sense and it just kinda of filled the space but with these smart filters I was able to mask out each of these windows and apply a variety of different filters to them to come up with what you see here so I started with a ripple filter then I went to a facet filter then I went to clouds and really I'm just making up stuff as I go along I was playing with a variety of different things just to see what would break up this repeating pattern that was happening in there and then lastly I did fibers when you zoom in you can kind of see that they all look kind of the same but because of the different lighting effects that are happening it doesn't really catch your eye and bring it immediately there something else I did to try and create the 3D of the doors was right here I did this layer here which gives it some light and dark shadows and then here I added some contrast so all of these layers and effects and everything are hidden inside of this smart object right here so let's move on I'm not actually going to be talking about railing just this second I'll come back to that one more interesting is this area in the back I want to create some depth to that building because basically it's looking very flat 
So this entire group in here, it's adding the color and the tone to it. And I know it just seems very easy for something that required many different layers. But there you go. All that is just sucked up inside of there. I have another layer up here for this sunset hue. And this is the mask for it. What it is is a selective color adjustment layer with that mask on it. And on the neutrals, it's adjusting the warms. So basically, it's just giving a little bit more of a warmth kick to that side of the image. That's really all it is. The next layer up, I start getting into this tower. And I do many different things in the tower itself in order to create depth and interest to it. One of those things is this tower windows. Once again, you can see it's a smart object, but what's inside of the smart object is kind of interesting. This is one of those tricks of the trade things that I came up with about a year ago where I wanted to put special effects, but I didn't have anything to put the special effect onto. So if you look at the actual layer that this is made up of, inside of this smart object, it's really nothing more than a layer of clouds. In this case, this is just gives it something to grab onto. And obviously, I'm trying to add clouds to the sky. So I created this black and white version. I turned it into a smart object. And then I put this mask on it, which is just these windows here. And by using a ripple and a zigzag effect, that gives it just interesting enough windows to mimic the reflections of the sky of what could be clouds on the other side. Once again, just adding a little bit more depth and interest inside of the image. Now this next one is very hard to see. Once again, sometimes you just get into the details of it. When I show you the mask of it, you can see it's simply the railings down the side here. And I'll zoom in a bit for you so that you can get a good look at it. You can see all it really is is whitening up some pieces of it, just so that it isn't completely warm down that side of the building. This just adds a little bit more punch to it. Once again, adding a little depth. Before I move on to this next part, I want to go back to the railing. I want to show you something that happened. Now, as I mentioned before, this image came from stock photography, where I don't know where it came from, and I don't know what the photographer did. But I do know that this image was retouched previously before we downloaded it. Once I got into this file, I'm pretty sure that the two buildings were here as part of the original image, and this sky was completely replaced from the original image. Let me show you. If we go back to that original downloaded file, and I zoom in down here, you can see this railing here. It comes across this first building, then it comes across this background building, and then it just stops dead. And then you see this kind of a funny thing going on here. Now this is as we downloaded it. So this is exactly as it was supplied to us. And then it continues on like this. I've got a pretty good feeling this entire sky really wasn't there like that. So what I actually did was I put that railing back in. This way it doesn't look like a hack job. As we start wrapping up the end of this video, I want to show you a trick that I came up with in order to best handle lens flares. Now, I try very hard not to do lens because I really don't want to be known as the lens flare guy. And I really think it's overused. However, it really does bring front and back elements together, and it does it in a really nice way. So as long as you use them conservatively on some of your images, not all of your images, you can definitely get away with it. But what I'm going to show you now is a little bit of a trick that I've learned in order to best handle them. And at the same time, I can clearly see that somewhere along the way I made a mistake. And the mistake itself probably came from jumping between different operating systems, the Mac to the PC, and saving the file many times. And I can see that there's definitely a problem. So I'm going to recreate it with you to show you how I actually handled it the first time. The problem is this. I can see that these two layers are simply two layers. There's not a smart object. There's not a mask. And so something about this just isn't right. Because I named it Null Lens Flare, and the longer name is Flash Gordon, 
I know specifically what lens flare I use to achieve this look. So I'm going to take this and, and we're just going to basically ignore it for right now and I'm going to show you how I would have built it. I'm going to create a new blank layer and I'm going to fill this layer with black with the key commands of Alt Backspace, I'm on a PC, or Command Backspace on a Mac, but it's otherwise fill black. Same difference. Now by itself, this doesn't help us, but what we can do is manipulate this layer in such a way that it gives us an incredible amount of flexibility. The first thing you want to do after creating a black layer is right click and go convert to smart object. Doing this is going to give it the flexibility that we need in order to make a proper lens flare. We change this layer's blend mode from normal to screen. Then you see it just disappears. Off, on, off, on. You can't see the difference, right? But when we put light things on top of it, you can totally see those. It just hides all the dark stuff. I'm going to use Photoshop's built-in lens flare. Filter, render, lens flare. Because of the way that this dialog box works, I have absolutely no idea where that corner of that building is. Yes, it's because I made it black, obviously, but even so, you can never get it quite in the right corner because you just can't see. You can't zoom in enough. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to guess. Just start by guessing, whatever. Pick something and then go OK. Well, clearly we're off by a mile. Because this is a smart object, however, I can just double click on lens flare, move it over a bit, and go OK. See, I'm still not on. I'll do it again. Push it over a little bit more, go OK. And there you go. Now I've hit the lens flare. But maybe I don't even like it over there. Maybe I want it on the complete opposite side. All I have to do is once again double click on it, move it over, maybe over there, go OK. And there you go with the lens flare. You get the idea. The basic problem is this. Lens flares built into Photoshop are very limited. You have this one, this one, this one, and this one. That's it. You know, I mean, it, it's nice and all, but they look very fake, and, and there's not too much you could do to actually alter them, which is why I don't like them and I don't use them. I strongly prefer a plug-in from Red Giant Software called Null Light Factory. When you open up this product, it gives you hundreds of lens flares to choose from. Now this is actually a really big dialog box and it doesn't let me scale it properly and I can't display it within this viewable window to you because it actually takes over the whole screen. So you'll have to use your imagination a little bit. But basically when you double click on these presets, they change and give different effects. So as you can see, they're pretty interesting. The one I settled on was Flash Gordon, which on the surface, it really looks like certainly not something that I would use. But I'll take it and I'll apply it, and then we'll see what we get. Because remember, we can always modify it afterwards by simply double clicking on it because it's a smart filter attached to a smart object. So as you can see, it starts taking us there, but it needs more work, so we'll double click on it. And then it gives us the option to turn different pieces of it off, like this. And you find the ones that you want and the ones that you don't want. And then you can click on different pieces of it. And then you can do different scalings of it, make it bigger, smaller, improve the brightness of it. You get the idea. You can do a lot of different things with it, move things around. So by simply doing that, it'll end up removing this piece there and leave this piece. It'll make it a little bit larger. And that kind of gives you an idea of what it's going to do. Now the reason that you see this offset a little bit inside of my preview that I had previously worked on, that's because I can take the layer itself and just start sliding it over. Now you can see that it chops it off. It's not perfect. You, you get the general idea. However, I had actually worked it. In the end, this is what I settled on. It's soft, it's subtle, it just kind of comes around and does whatever it is that it does.
because once it hits the final print at the final size, it simply brings your eye around and allows you to focus on the focal point of the image. But before we get into the very final touches of this, I did a overall contrast just to give it a little bit more visual punch. And then what I did was I took everything, all of these different layers, and once again I did a right click and I converted to another smart object. I know I'm crazy with these smart objects, but you can keep doing really great things with them. So once I did that next smart object, it was at this point that I recropped the image. Notice how I took off all of the cloning I did in the background for this building, which was looking fake anyway, and that's why I did it. it. It was too much. But it gave you enough to make you believe that it looks proper. And I also took off this background building here, and I cut off a little bit here. But the reason that I recropped it is because this is how the magazine was going to be printing it. Once again, this is at print size. But the final problem I actually have is this. Here is that gutter that we were talking about before. Once the paper folds into this gutter, there isn't a lot of gap going on. And basically, it's very tight over here inside of that gutter. And then we have all of this dead space over here. And it doesn't look balanced. So what I needed to do was go one final step for the magazine. And it actually caused me a whole lot of pain. And I didn't want to do it. But I ended up having to suck it up for the magazine in order to properly put this building where it belongs. But I literally cut out this building, made it bigger, and moved it over so that it looked like this. So as you can see, this helps a lot because now it's not right inside of the gutter, but there is still enough room for some text, some pictures, logos, whatever it is that the designers want to put in on this side of the page. A couple different steps actually went into doing that. One of which was I needed to clone out this side of the building. So as you can see, I took some cloning and I just moved it over. Then I put in the building on top, which was a copy paste. But that created a whole other problem down below where inside of this railing, it's all wrong. So this layer fixes that particular problem and puts in all the little in-betweens. And then this top layer here called railing puts the railing back in properly. And then when you zoom out, it all looks seamless. There's the gutter. Here's this visual element that brings your eye into the focal point, which is the building back here. I added a lens flare over here to give some pop to this image on this side. We've got warmth on one side, cool on the other. We got lights, we got darks. And ultimately, this is the final image. There's only one other step that I ended up doing that is not shown here. What I noticed was when my issue 126 printed and I saw it, it was actually very light. The lighter print opened up the midtones too much and I could see imperfections. And I really didn't like the way that it came out. So in order to finish this before I finally sent it off to the magazine, I did one more curve and I just simply darkened right through the midtones of the image. And then it looked dark on screen, but I'm pretty sure it'll print a lot better on the back end because it has more contrast. And so that wraps up this episode of Behind the Retouching. And once again, my name is John Ross from the Art of Retouching Studio. So please go to www.theartofretouching.com where you can learn more tips and tricks to make you a better photo retoucher.